Welcome to Open Minds, a Freedom of Thought podcast series, interviewing the people who bring courage and independent thought to the challenges of today. All right, hi there, I'm James Burnham, and we're with, here with Jonathan Mitchell. It's National Lawyer Convention Week, so we're not at our usual location for these podcasts, but otherwise everything will be, I think, the same as usual. So Jonathan, you're widely regarded, certainly by me, as one of the most creative legal thinkers and impactful lawyers in the country. Among your many achievements, I think the one that really put you on the map, certainly got you in the New York Times, the failing New York Times, uh, was drafting SB8, the Texas law providing a private right of action for a minimum of $10,000 against anyone who aids or abets an abortion after five weeks, which effectively, as designed, disables the federal courts from enjoining it, even though at that time, Roe versus Wade was still good law. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk to you about that and a lot of other things, but first, I thought we could just do a little bit about your background and how we got to where you are today. So I think the most sort of fundamental question for you and most people listening is, what made you want to be a lawyer? Why'd you go to law school? I was interested in law. It came around later, uh, very late in the day during my undergraduate education, where I just thought going to law school would be a more uh, interesting career path than going to graduate school and trying to get a PhD. There was more opportunity. The law seemed very broad, a lot of so many different areas of academic interests that you can pursue in, in the law, whereas I think going to graduate school would have been more narrow once you kind of lock yourself into a particular field of study. So, uh, but again, when I started law school, I wasn't necessarily expecting any of these particular things to happen. But my interest, and I think some of it was piqued by just reading interesting things in the legal realm, you know, both Supreme Court opinions and also some of the academic writing of law professors that, again, I had gotten a very cursory view of as a student in, in college, but those were things that really piqued my interest in studying law further. Awesome. How did you end up choosing Chicago for law school? You went to the University of Chicago, for yeah. those who don't know, great school, I went there too. How did you pick that? So I started law school in 1998, and at the time, I visited the University of Chicago twice as a prospective student, and it was just so impressive to see the classroom environment and the faculty at the time, the, the faculty roster was amazing. You had people who were just Hall of Fame caliber law professors and scholars. And I just had a better feeling there than any other schools that I was considering in terms of just where I think I would learn and develop and be able to grow as, as a lawyer and as a thinker. Uh, when you were at the school, who were the faculty members that were the most sort of influential for you as a young know, student? Yeah, there were so many of them. I think certainly in terms of the classroom instruction, almost every professor I had had a, a big impact just in terms of showing me how to think and, and how to teach and how to approach issues with, with integrity and with rigor. And on the scholarship side, as a student, you're not reading as much of your professor's work because the class assignments are mostly focused on case law and the case method. But to the extent I was able to read some of the work produced by my instructors, all of it had an impact. Professor Epstein, I knew a bit from even before I started from law school, but others, uh, both on the right and the left, you know, Professor Sunstein, Professor Strauss, Judge Posner, uh, so many of them had thrown down really serious challenges to some of the ways I had thought about law as, a, as an early law student. And a lot of the questions that they've posed have been challenges that I've been trying to think about and answer over the last 20 or so years that I've been a lawyer. So was Judge Posner teaching pretty actively then? When I was there, he was kind of not around much. He would teach a class a year. That's I took, awesome. Yeah, I took one class from him. It was called Law and Economics of Healthcare Systems, which he co-taught with Tom Phillipson at the Public Policy School. So, uh, but he was such a prolific writer and, and was just writing a book a year at the time, maybe probably more than that. I mean, he would, he would write faster than I could read them. And Professor Sunstein was the same way. They just constantly cranking out new books. And those books were being talked about at the law school, even among the students and among the faculty in class. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so what did you do after, after law school? After law school, I clerked for two years. I started off clerking on the Fourth Circuit for Judge Ludig. And after clerking there, I clerked for Justice Scalia for a year. So I finished my clerkships in summer of 2003. So graduated in 2001. What were those like? What was like clerking for Judge Ludig? It was a really interesting experience. He, he gave us a lot of latitude, but also a lot of training. He was very much trying to teach us how to write and how to draft, not just with the bench memos, but with the opinion writing itself. And 
just how to rigorously approach cases. When you're a law student, you're just reading the opinions in the case book after they come out. When you're clerking, you have more involvement in the production of judicial opinions and preparing for oral argument and thinking about hard questions to ask the lawyers and thinking about how to write the opinion before it's written. So it was just different because law school, you sort of take the final product that you get from the courts as it is. And then with clerking, there's just a lot more thought that goes into how to produce good product, good judicial work product. And that was kind of the heyday of the conservative Fourth Circuit, right? I mean, back, back in those days, the Fourth Circuit was one of the great conservative circuits in the country, right? Or do I have yeah. that? It was back then, yeah. It, things changed pretty quickly after I finished clerking. But at the time, there was a majority of Republican-appointed judges, and almost all of them had textualist or originalist instincts when it came to either statutory construction or constitutional law. It must have been fascinating. Yeah, at the time it was. And then what was it like clerking for the great man, Justice Scalia? We had an interesting term. I mean, I started there in the fall of 2002, so it was October term 2002. That was the term that certain cases were decided, such as Grutter and Gratz on affirmative ah. action, and Lawrence against Texas, which overruled Bowers against Hardwick, created a substantive due process right to homosexual conduct. And some other cases, Garamendi, which didn't get as much media attention, but it was an important case on foreign relations power, and some others. The term, I think, started well for the Scalia chambers in terms of being in the majority quite a bit. It ended very poorly. We wound up in dissent quite a bit. So it was kind of an up and down term, and the justices' mood fluctuated with how the term was going. He really liked winning, right? I think he hated losing <laughs> more, more than he liked winning, but he cared about this stuff and it showed just in his daily demeanor. No, I'm sure. So I've, I've read somewhere that you've been quoted as saying that you didn't have as much faith in the Supreme Court after the clerkship as before the clerkship um, because the decision making was more politicized and results oriented than you had expected. I was just wondering if you could elaborate some on that. Yeah, I can't disclose court conferences, no, so I can't go into too much detail, but it's a nine member institution, I think, and part of the difficulty when you have nine different individuals deciding cases of constitutional magnitudes, they all think differently. So it, it's hard for the court as an institution to develop a consistent or coherent set of jurisprudence, even when it's purporting to follow precedent and stare decisis and claims to value those things, stability, consistency. It's, it's, it's hard for that to happen, even when all the judges are acting in good faith and, and trying their best. Yeah, I mean, do you think that judges should, uh, or the justices really should be blind to the political ramifications of their decisions? So, like, for example, Justice Scalia was obviously a great scholar and a great originalist, but he was also an extraordinarily effective political operative before he was on the court, and I would say even as a public spokesman for originalism and all that. Mm -hmm. Do you think he did or should have been ignoring all the sort of practical consequences of the things uh, you know, he was deciding at the court? I don't think he did ignore the practical or political consequences. He, he himself described himself as a faint-hearted originalist in that Law Review article he wrote on originalism being the lesser evil. And he even admitted he wouldn't take originalism to its logical conclusion, in part because it could produce results that are normatively horrifying mm -hmm. to most people. So uh, again, I think everyone's an originalist to a certain extent. You know, even, even Justice Brennan and Marshall would make originalist arguments on occasion. But no one, I think even Justice Scalia or Judge Bork, is a, a full-throated originalist in the sense that they would always follow the original meaning no matter what, without any regard to stare decisis, or without any regard to consequences. It seems to be really an issue of degree. You know, how much of an originalist are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we should, we'll have a, we should talk about originalism in, in some depth, but I do mm -hmm. think it's helpful for people to learn more about kind of your, your path. So after that, you went to OLC mm -hmm. uh, at the height of the War on Terror, uh, right? 2003, I think. Yes. Yeah. So what was, what was that like? I mean, who was the Assistant Attorney General at the time, and, and kind of what, you know, what was that experience like? Yeah, so the, the Assistant Attorney General was Jack Goldsmith. Yeah. And he started, I think he was confirmed right before I started as an Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel. Or, I'm sorry, the title is Attorney Advisor in, in the Office of Legal Counsel. So he was my former professor at University of Chicago. He taught me Ah. civil procedure, and I took two other classes from him as well. So it was great to work for him, and we were dealing with all sorts of naughty questions about how you apply the Geneva Conventions and international humanitarian law to this new context, the war on terror, where you're fighting an enemy that hasn't signed the Geneva Conventions, and 
doesn't abide by those principles? And then how do you apply a treaty that was written for wars between nation states in, in this new context where it's a war not between another country or another signatory to the convention, but against this amorphous terrorist entity? And then we also had to deal with questions about the war in Iraq, which had started shortly before I joined the Office of Legal Counsel. So lots of international law questions that came up. Jack was the perfect person to lead the office at that time. Had you thought much about those issues before you got there, no. or did you have to kind of learn on the job, like clerking? Yeah, I, I never thought about the substance of legal issues before, yeah. although I, I had thought about broader issues of interpretation, textualism, sure. and things like that, and how do you apply the text of a treaty in this situation to a context that the treaty wasn't really written to address, or no one really thought about how it would apply in this situation. That's similar to what people talk about with the Constitution, where it's written at a certain time, and then 200 years later, new circumstances arise that may not have been anticipated at the time the document was crafted. Sure, absolutely. So then, okay, so you went from OLC, then you went to academia, mm -hmm. and, and then I'm just curious about what that was like and, and what your path was at that point. So I started in 2006 as a visiting assistant professor at the University of Chicago. That was a two-year appointment where you, because right now in academia, you have to be published before you get hired, even as an entry-level professor. So if you want to become an academic, you need to do something before going on the market where you can produce written scholarship. And you need to do that really as a full-time job. You, you can't write a law review article if you're a, working at a law firm right. <laughs> and billing 2,000 or 3,000 hours a year. Maybe you can pull that off. If, I, if, I if, couldn't, but yeah. maybe you could. <laughs> no, I, no I, I couldn't do it either. I, in order to write scholarship and do it well, you have to be focusing on it full-time. Right. And that's what you have to be thinking about constantly, and you can't have distractions. Maybe, again, there may be some rare people who can pull that off and think about many different things at once. So that's where I started to first starting writing published scholarship and used that to try to get an entry-level position later. And uh, so again, I started there at the University of Chicago. After that, I went to George Mason for about two and a half years as an assistant professor. And after that, I left academia to join the Texas Solicitor General's office. Yeah, so I, I am actually, this is, I actually don't know the answer to this. I'm very curious to hear about that move um, mm -hmm. because I think, you know, I think you're the only academic, right, who's served in that job since it was created. So I'm just mm -hmm. wondering how you jumped from academia to sort of the more rough and tumble world of the, the Solicitor General of Texas at a time when they were, you, the state was constantly, you know, suing the Obama administration and doing really interesting cutting edge stuff. Yeah, it, it, it came about really through serendipity. The, my predecessor on that job was Jim Ho, who's now a judge on the Fifth Circuit, but he knew me from law school. He was a 3L when I was a 1L, and his wife, Allison, was in the class between us. So she was a 2L when I was a 1L, and, mm -hmm. and when he was a 3L. So Jim called me out of the blue in the summer of 2010 and mentioned that he was about to leave the office and asked me if I wanted to replace him. Oh, that's awesome. So that's how it came about. I wasn't really thinking about leaving academia at the time. But when he called and offered the position, it seemed like it would be an interesting thing to do because I wanted to get more ideas for scholarship and I thought that taking a job like that would help generate more article ideas. Most of the article ideas that I've gotten have come from litigating cases and not from reading other legal Imagine scholarship. That. Well, I shouldn't, yeah. <laughs> that's probably not the right answer to give at a job interview if you want to get an academic job. But for me, it was the truth and I just thought that even though I really enjoyed my time in academia and it was a great way to develop ideas, you also want to be able to put your ideas into action. And it's hard to do that when you're just sitting in an office yeah, writing Why, why do you suppose that? I mean, I feel like in the, in the sort of glory days of law schools, mm -hmm. the, the law professoriate was writing, were writing things that mattered and things that the justices would actually read yeah. and that would actually become re relevant to real life. Right. Why do you suppose it is that you know, as you say, that's not the right answer to give an interview. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of reasons for that. And I think you're right to point out the trend that's been happening. Part of it is I think we have a lot of refugees from PhDs yeah. who want to get law school appointments because it's a much better gig. So you're seeing people... It pay, pays better. It, well. it certainly pays better. Yeah. Teaching load is lighter. It's much easier to get tenure. Tenure is almost automatic in law schools. That's not the case in most academic fields. Typically, the presumption is against tenure mm -hmm. if you're in the humanities or the social sciences or anywhere else. And yeah, it's just a, it's a cushier job than being a professor in, a, in basically any other type of academic field. So you're starting to see stuff that passes for legal scholarship that's not really about law. And you're seeing 
job talks from entry-level candidates that are chapters from their PhD dissertation. Mm -hmm. And they may have a law degree, they may not. Some of them don't even have law degrees. But a lot of the articles that are getting published these days tend to be less about law and more about interdisciplinary work. And some of it's interesting. I don't want to say that it's bad scholarship. It might actually be great scholarship, but it's not as relevant to what lawyers do or what courts do as I think what was being written 30 or 40 years ago. Sure. So what were some of your uh, biggest matters when you were the, the Texas SG uh, that you can remember? Yeah, there was constant conflict between the state of Texas and the Obama administration. I mean, back then, it was really just, Texas was the only state then, right, that had a really fully developed SG's office, I think. I mean, now, blessedly, we have a lot more, but I yeah. think it was basically just you guys. We had a pretty big office. We had about 15 line attorneys That's awesome. and two deputies and a, and a solicitor general and very good attorneys. You know, we were able to attract some very high quality legal talent in the office. I think now we have more states that are trying to emulate that model, both Democratic states and Republican right. states. But it was helpful because you had a really strong team of attorneys that could write briefs and that greatly expanded the number of cases we could bring. And we had an attorney general at the time who was very litigious and wanted- I don't think that's changed. <laughs> yeah, I think the current, yeah, the current attorney general is also very eager yeah. to, to bring lawsuits against the federal government. But Greg Abbott in particular wanted to, and it wasn't just for political reasons either. I think he truly believed that the federal government had gotten beyond its constitutionally assigned powers, and he wanted to push back on that. Both, I think it benefited him politically for sure, but I think he also truly believed in it as a lawyer and as a former state Supreme Court justice, which is what he was. Oh, I mean, no, it was, it was critical work mm -hmm. um, that you know, none of the other states were able to pick up that slack. One of the ones, I, didn't you successfully defend basically the same law that Whole Woman's, that then became Whole Women's Health from Louisiana in the Fifth Circuit? Or yeah. am I wrong about no, that? No, that's right. Yeah. yeah. That's, we, we won that case in the Fifth Circuit. Were you surprised that the court, the Supreme Court got that wrong? No, I wasn't surprised because the court at the time had a different membership from what it has today. Yeah. Nothing the pro-abortion judges do on the Supreme Court ever surprises me. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, so then after that, you went back to academia, right? To Stanford? And right. Different? Yeah. What was it like going back after having done something more real and practical for, for a while? Yeah, I had a better agenda going back on what I wanted to write about. And I had accumulated a lot more ideas from my time in the SG's office where I basically had a list of articles I wanted to write when I got back to the academy. So I banged out two of them at Stanford. One of them was called Textualism in the 14th Amendment, and the other one was The Root of a Racial Fallacy. So I wrote those while I was at Hoover and at Stanford. And the idea was to go back into academia in 2016 or 2017. When Trump won the election, I started to shift my focus more toward possible government positions, possible judicial appointments, or possible work in private practice. Mm -hmm. And that's what you ended up doing, right? You went back to private practice, or I guess yeah. private practice for the first time. Eventually I did, yeah. I was nominated for a position at the... I it, it, yes. <laughs> you, uh, would have been great. <laughs> that would have been. I, I, I did get voted out of committee, but the, the nomination never got a vote on the Senate floor, so... For those who don't know, uh, was, uh, Jonathan was nominated to be the chairman of ACUS, the Administrative Conference of the United right. States, where you could have written a lot of... We could have caused a lot of trouble. Yeah, <laughs> so I think I think the nomination was made in, on September September of 2017, but a year and a half went by and there was no vote. I got voted out of committee in March. At the time, there was still the 30-hour rule, I believe, right. and that's what was bottling up everything. So Terrible. Mitch McConnell, who was the Senate Majority Leader, needed to use those 30 hours judiciously for every nominee and prior every judge. They every judge, every right? Single judge, right? So, and you have to prioritize the judges over sure. Acus. I mean, Acus was a five-year appointment, the judges are for life. So I don't begrudge him for making that priority and making those decisions, but I needed to find something to do. So I eventually got tired of waiting, so I opened my own law firm in 2018. Right. So yeah, let's let's talk about that, but I thought first it'd be helpful for everyone to kind of talk about your legal philosophy and just kind of how you think about law. Mm -hmm. So just to start at the sort of broadest level, you know, how would you describe your legal philosophy? Textualist and legalistic and formalistic as opposed to consequentialist. Okay, and what were sort of, you, you mentioned even in college you were reading sort of the canonical works. What are the main, you know, what, what first kind of grabbed your imagination and made you think, aha, this is, you know, this is the right way to do law? It's hard to think of a particular moment where it grabbed me. Yeah. I think in law school, many of my law professors were overtly consequentialist in their philosophy, both on the right and the left. It wasn't just 
left of center professors who I mean, thought Poser, this way. D that was the whole point yeah. for him, right? Uh, it's all about consequences. Right. Yeah. Judge Posner was a great example of that. But even Professor Epstein has justified his own classical liberal framework through the lens of utilitarianism. And, and certainly Professor Sunstein has been consequentialist in the way he's argued for theories of interpretation. And for me, what's been difficult for me to accept is consequentialism, I'm not saying that it's wrong, but it's, at least from my standpoint, it's not a very satisfying way to write judicial opinions or to justify judicial decisions because people can't agree on what counts as a good consequence. That's the whole reason they're in court in the first place. You know, so for the judge to try to justify a decision by an appeal to consequences, I don't think has as much power in attempting to persuade a person to accept the decision who may not like the outcome as arguing from the words of a document that all of us agree constitutes fundamental law. When isn't so, it sort of inherently arbitrary for the same reason? When the judge is just deciding on what the right outcome is in his or her view? There's some of that. I mean, yeah. they still have to justify their decision. But another difficult question for consequentialists is when should we be rule consequentialists and when should we be act consequentialists, right? So uh, rule consequentialism tries to focus on the systemic consequences that adhere to or that in here in following texts of legal enactments. So you could actually make a consequentialist argument for textualism, I suppose. But why should we be a, why should we approach it from a rule consequentialist framework rather than an act consequentialist standpoint and just look at what is the best outcome in this particular case? And to me, there's just no obviously right answer. There's no obvious right answer to that question about when we should pursue rule consequentialism at the expense of act consequentialism. And, and do, you, do you think, the, to some extent, the arguments for originalism and textualism are themselves rule consequentialist arguments, that this is just the fairest yeah. and most neutral way to do it? Well, some people try to justify it that way. Yeah. But, it, but again, I, I don't think that's the most persuasive justification for textualism or originalism, because it's, it's, not as all, it's not at all clear to me that originalism produces the best normatively desirable consequences. In fact, I think there's a very good argument it doesn't if you try to look at some of the hard cases that people always want to throw at us, Brown against Board of Education, right, which is hard to justify on originalist grounds. Loving against Virginia, same thing. There are so many non-originalist rulings of the Supreme Court that have undoubtedly produced normatively desirable results that it seems to me hard to justify originalism by saying this is the theory that produces good consequences across the board. Yeah, so let's talk about some of the critiques of originalism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for, first, what do you say to the people who, who sort of argue that it's impossible to know what the original meaning of the Constitution is when it was written, you know, 200 years ago, and we're dealing with modern problems uh, in a modern society? There's a, there's a famous quote from Justice mm -hmm. Alito that I always think about for this in a case about California's prohibition on kids buying violent video games where he says an argument, and Justice Alito is very funny. Uh, he goes, you know, what Justice Scalia wants to know is what James Madison thought about violent video games and if he enjoyed them. Do you think that's a fair criticism of originalism, or, or what do you, what's sort of your reaction to that? And I don't want to put words in Justice Alito's mouth, but in the idea yeah. that this is just so indeterminate that all we're doing is making stuff up just like they are. No, it's certainly true. There are, there are going to be situations where there just is no original understanding because nobody thought about this particular problem, nobody could anticipate this particular problem, and no one had any idea how the text should apply to this problem if it were to arise. So I, that, that's certainly a fair criticism of originalism. And there needs to be a theory for what courts should do in those situations. I don't think the right answer, though, is to say that just because we can't determine the original meaning of a provision as it applies to a particular situation, that should therefore liberate courts or judges to interpret it however they want, right? So that critique of originalism to me does not in any way justify judicial adventurism or, or a living constitution mindset, but it is a challenge that originalists need to answer. What do you do in those types of situations? Because, what do you think? Well, you can't appeal to the original meaning if there is none, right? And you, you can't make an originalist argument without evidence or reason to believe that there was a, a settled understanding about the text as it applies in this particular context. Yeah, I mean, that's just... That's one of the problems with originalism. So if you were on the court, would you say the Constitution just doesn't speak to this and therefore the democratic process, you know, subject to enumerated powers and all that, gets to decide? Or how would you... Yeah, I mean, you're going to have to ask me what it would be in this specific question. But yeah, as a general matter, if there's no settled original meaning to appeal to, if there's no text that can trump the democratically enacted legislation in the Constitution, uh, it's very hard to justify how the courts could then override 
a statute that has been enacted by Congress or by one of the states. You need to justify why the court can come in and say, no, you can't enforce this law, even though it's a law. And what are you going to appeal to? You have to appeal to some higher source of authority. Is it the text of the Constitution? Is it the original understanding of that text? What is it? If you have nothing other than what the judge wants to do, I don't think that's enough, right? It's mm -hmm. just not enough to say, we think this law is unjust, so we're not going to allow a state official to enforce it. Mm -hmm. you, you need something more than just the mere belief from a judge that this is bad policy. Yeah, that makes sense. So what about the notion, which is another argument folks make, that originalism itself is not even really originalist? So for example, you know, do we have any originalist evidence that the framers themselves or their contemporaries understood the law this way, that they thought it would have sort of a fixed meaning? I think as Justice Scalia famously said, I don't want a living constitution, I want one that is dead, dead, dead. Is there, are you, I mean, is that a reasonable account of what folks thought was happening at the time? Well, if we look at the text, I mean, they could have locked in the original meaning in certain situations if they wanted to, all right? So let's take a look at the right of jury trial. There was a decision from Justice Gorsuch a few years ago, Ramos against Louisiana, where he makes an originalist appeal to the meaning of jury trial and says that it has to be unanimous because at the time this provision was enacted, we had a, an understanding that jury verdicts had to be unanimous, mm -hmm. right? But they didn't lock that into the text. They could have done that, right? They could have said, you have a right to a jury trial of 12 good men and true, which was the settled understanding at the time. But they didn't use those words. They just said right to trial by jury. So that leaves room for a jury to include women in the future, even though including women on juries was assuredly not part of the original understanding of the word jury. Right? But if the framers wanted to lock in the original meaning of the word jury, they could have done that through the text that they chose. They didn't say a jury of 12 men. They said a jury. So, so that might be a place where originalism runs out and you should defer to the state officials rather than sort of add this gloss beyond what the text right. has based on your sort of what was going on at the time. Yeah, I think the question is what does the text lock in, right? Yeah. And just choosing the word jury rather than jury of 12 men would seem to indicate they didn't intend to lock in the understanding of jury that existed at that time because they could have used the words that incorporated all those features of mm -hmm. the jury as it existed in 1791. They chose not to do so. They also didn't incorporate the requirement of a unanimous jury verdict. Right. So, okay, so that, that makes sense. So what do you do with things um, where maybe there are strong originalist arguments against them that are nonetheless bedrocks of current jurisprudence? So, and this is one that I, I'm sure you'll have thoughts yeah. on. What about judicial review itself? I mean, I, I'm not aware, Marbury is certainly not an originalist opinion in its crafting, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not aware of a lot of originalist scholarship that anyone thought the court was going to be deciding right. which acts of Congress don't get to take effect. So what do you do with oh, that? Oh, don't say don't take effect. That's the reverse yeah, yeah. fallacy, right? The, 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 that are trumped by the uh, higher law of the Constitution. Right. I mean, th does the Supreme Court get to essentially choose its own interpretation of the Constitution when Congress has chosen a different one? That's, that's the difficult question to answer. Right. And you know, in terms of the textual arguments Marshall made in Marbury, the textual arguments are quite feeble. You know, there's, there's not a convincing textual argument that I can see in the text of Article Three or anywhere else in the Supremacy Clause that implies that the Supreme Court gets to override Congress's decisions when it comes to what the Constitution means. Now that said, Marbury's been around for you know, over 200 years and you wouldn't get confirmed to the Supreme Court if you denied the correctness of Marbury, which is interesting because you would think Congress would prefer to aggrandize powers for itself. But no, they don't like to make any decisions at all. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's somewhat contrary to James Madison's belief that ambition would counteract ambition and every, the individuals who populate our institutions would want to aggrandize the power of that institution. That's actually not the case. It's, Congress seems to want the court to have the power of judicial review and they wouldn't confirm a person of the Supreme Court who denied it. That would be seen as uh, too radical or outside the mainstream. So it's possible, I think, to read the Constitution to allow for judicial review. I don't want to say that the, the textual case is, is frivolous. When I say judicial review, I'm talking about judicial review of congressional statutes. But I think most scholars would agree that as a textual matter, congressional supremacy is the easier view to defend than judicial review under Marbury. What about presidential action? where the courts are reviewing, the president says, you know, in my judgment, the statutes and the Constitution allow me to do X, Y, and Z. And this is sort of, I, you know, I served in the civil division in the Trump administration, yeah. so I defended cases about this topic, you know, once a week. You know, what are your thoughts on so that? So the question is, can the president just say, even though this is a 
yeah, statute President, enacted President by Jackson Congress. Jackson said, you know, the Chief Justice has rendered his opinion now that I've enforced it. Well, that's a little different. You're talking about the President not enforcing a Supreme Court ruling. E either one. Either um, one. Yeah, All right, yeah. so can the President can just the, say... Can the Court review the President's actions either pursuant to statute or his refusal to enforce its own decrees? To me, they seem very intertwined. Yeah, so whether the President can use his independent constitutional judgment not to enforce an act of Congress that has passed and he has signed, or maybe, well, somebody signed. maybe his predecessor <laughs> yeah. signed it, he thinks it's unconstitutional. So that's, again, there's no clear answer from the Constitution on whether he can do that or to what extent. You could argue, I think plausibly, that he has an obligation to enforce the statutes that Congress has passed, whether he agrees with them or not on constitutional grounds, uh, because it does say he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Now, what does the word laws mean? Yeah. Obviously, laws includes the Constitution, right. but whose interpretation of the Constitution counts? Is it the President's own interpretation, or is it the interpretation that's embodied in the statute that passed the bicameralism or presentment process? You could construe the word laws either way. Not a clear answer to this. So the way this has been settled has been primarily through practice. I mean, presidents have, for the most part, enforced statutes passed by Congress even when they think them unconstitutional. President Obama did this with the Defense of Marriage Act. He had Eric Holder argue in court mm -hmm. that the statute was unconstitutional, but he still enforced it under the Take Care Clause, which seems interesting. This was raised at oral argument in the United States against Windsor. Like, right. what, why are you coming into court saying the statute's unconstitutional? Yeah, yeah. Right, but then simultaneously saying we're going to enforce it under the Take Care Clause under Article 2. Well, you can do that. You can thread the needle if you interpret the word laws to mean the Constitution as interpreted by Congress rather than the Constitution as interpreted by the President of the United States. So, but, but even if you say the President has an obligation to enforce the laws Congress enacts, mm -hmm. isn't there then a second question about why is it the Supreme Court's job or how does it have the authority to decide when that has or hasn't happened? I mean, wouldn't a lot of people at the framing rate may have thought that Congress is supposed to enforce its own will on the president rather than have you know nine unelected justices at the time in the basement now across the street settle all this for them you're saying like having the justices tell the president yeah. to enforce a statute yeah. that he's not enforcing yeah. i mean they're, they're difficult articles or, or say that he's yeah. gone beyond what the statute allows that was usually what we were dealing with is the president wanted to do something right and we'd have people coming into court saying the statutes don't allow it or you know whatever article two doesn't go that far and then the Supreme Court gets to decide rather than Congress. Right, I mean, Congress can impeach the president, right? Congress has other or remedies defund. to defund, stop confirming his nominees, launch an investigation. Congress has plenty of weapons to protect its own prerogatives. So you know, the, the Supreme Court is a court of law. So whether it can do these things, I think, depends on its jurisdiction. Congress controls the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. If Congress gives the Supreme Court jurisdiction to decide a case of this type, I don't think the court can just decline jurisdiction because it doesn't want to decide the case. So ultimately, the political branches will control what the court's role will be in resolving these disputes. I don't think there's a clear answer to any of this in the Constitution. We've been working this out over the last 200 years through different branches asserting powers, and the, the, the different branches have tools at their disposal to check the other branches that they think one of them has gone too far. And for the most part, they haven't been willing yet to check the judiciary. They may Not reconsider yet. that stance, <laughs> right? But they have ways to bring the judiciary into line if they want to. They can take away its jurisdiction if they can get a statute passed to do that. They have plenty of other things they can do. What do you think about court packing? That was in the news for a while, yeah. it kind of went away. I mean, Congress can do it. I don't think there's any question about that. Even people who disagree with the goal of court packing would acknowledge it's a lawful and constitutionally based prerogative of Congress. I just don't think the court's critics need to go that far. They're, if you have 60 votes in the Senate to pass a court packing bill, there are a whole lot of other things you can do as well uh, before you get to court packing to counteract whatever decisions of the Supreme Court you don't like. We, we can talk about some of them. Jurisdiction stripping is the most obvious one. Just take away the court's jurisdiction. If you don't like the court's Second Amendment cases, just say the court has no jurisdiction to hear Second Amendment cases. And that is, a, that is a practice with a long tradition in our politics, right? Uh, and in the old yeah. days, Congress used to do that with some frequency. Certainly it? with respect to the lower courts. I think yeah. everyone would agree Congress can take away the jurisdiction of a federal district court to issue an injunction against state gun control laws if, if Congress so chose to do so. Yeah. Again, I don't think the votes are there to do that sort of thing, and I don't think they will be for the foreseeable future. But with the Supreme Court, it's a slightly more complicated question because they would have to invoke the exceptions clause of Article 3. But my own belief is Congress has plenary control over the Supreme Court's jurisdiction in the same way it has plenary control over the lower court's jurisdiction. So it may be a related question then is uh, about standing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Justice Scalia, a lot of the conservative justices and the originalist justices have been very 
be a punctilious about enforcing the rules of standing under Article 3. And I was just wondering if you think there's a good originalist argument that there is such a requirement in the first place, that Congress cannot, for example, and I think you argued Spokio, didn't you? I didn't argue it, but I... You were involved in Spokio. Uh, I wasn't involved in it either, but I, I was certainly sympathetic to Will Consovoy's argument. Now, Will, Will did it. Okay. Yeah. Well, just as good. Almost yes. as good. Yes. Uh, but so, so, I mean, it would seem to me that Will would have a very compelling originalist argument that if Congress wants to create a cause of action and award statutory damages for anybody who establishes its you know, requirements, where does this idea that you have to have suffered some harm come from? He was totally right. And he actually said this at oral argument. And Justice Kagan, of all people, tried to steer him away from that. And I think she was trying to help him out by telling him, look, we don't have the votes for that. Yeah. Try to make a different argument if you yeah. want to win this case. So where are we right now? I mean, it's gotten worse, right? You, now we have TransUnion, which doubles down on the idea that Congress can't, by statute, mm -hmm. confer s standing on people, you know, unless there's some concrete injury which the court says has to be based in, I think, common, the type of injury that would give rise to a cause of action in common it's law. A it's, it's like the data breach, you can bring the data breach claim for statutory damages if you have one dollar of injury, but not if you don't. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, why don't we just call them key tam relators? Because <laughs> that's also, con the key tam relator doesn't need to show any harm. So can we just call them key tam relators? And then, then it works? So where does this come from? I mean, what? It's, well, it's, it's made, it's comes from judicial precedent. It's, yeah. it's, it, this is, it's, it's, I think what David Strauss would call common law constitutional interpretation. It's, it's rooted in judicial precedent. It's not rooted in text. And it's certainly not rooted in the original meaning, for sure. I mean, look, if, if key TAM relators can sue, they're not injured, right? No, I wouldn't think. Okay. So, I mean, when I read TransUnion, I kept writing in the margin, what about key TAM? What about key TAM? And I never saw an answer for that anywhere in the court's opinion. Maybe that's next. <laughs> I don't know. They've already upheld Keytam in Vermont Agency, so yeah. they'd have to overrule precedent if they wanted to take that down. So speaking of precedent, I mean, mm -hmm. how, how as an originalist d does one deal with precedent? I mean, what would be, you know, Justice Mitchell's view on, you know, God willing, uh, yeah. on, on how to reconcile the original meaning of the Constitution with stare decisis? Yeah, I've written on this. It's a, it's a really difficult question for anyone who's a legalist or a textualist or a formalist like me, because stare decisis is almost invariably justified in consequentialist terms. Justice Scalia justified stare decisis this way. He called, it, he called it a pragmatic exception to his normal originalist philosophy. And when I read that, I just, I recoil uh, for, for a lot of reasons. Number one, if you can have pragmatic exceptions to originalism in order to uphold a precedent that you don't want to overrule, why can't we have other pragmatic exceptions to originalism if you think there's a normatively desirable consequence? And then, you know, the second concern I've always had with that theory of stare decisis is it almost seems to admit that consequences really are the touchstone of proper judicial decision making rather than adherence to text or original meaning. So I do think precedent has an important role to play. I don't agree with Professor Lawson and others who have said that you should just never consider stare decisis. You just always interpret the Constitution according to what you think is right and make the Constitution the best it can be in all cases. If people said different things in the past, well, they're wrong. You follow the Constitution, you don't follow precedent. I think that's I think that view is not, I certainly don't think that view is textually compelled. And let's go back to what we were saying earlier about Marbury against Madison. It's not at all clear the text of the Constitution compels the Supreme Court to declare an act of Congress unconstitutional, even when it sincerely believes that the act of Congress is unconstitutional. So to me, when the Supreme Court invokes stare decisis, as it often does in cases that involve challenges to Congress's legislation, claiming that Congress has exceeded its enumerated powers, and the court invokes precedent to uphold a statute that clearly is outside the original meaning of the commerce power. They do this all the time. They've done it since 1937, yeah. right? I think the way to understand what the court's doing in that situation is not that it's ignoring the Constitution or allowing an unconstitutional law to be enforced, but what they're doing instead is they're shrinking the scope of the Marbury prerogative, which is not constitutionally compelled in the first place. And by deferring to Congress's interpretation of the Constitution, even though the court thinks it's wrong, they're not in any way engaging in treason to the Constitution by doing that. They're just acknowledging we don't necessarily have to be the institution that has the final word on what the Constitution means. And here, we're going to allow Congress to have that final word. If you do that, you're still being faithful to the text of the Constitution, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because the text of the Constitution does not speak to the ultimate question of whether Congress or the Supreme Court should have the final word on what it means.
So that actually leads me to another question that I think will build on that. So other people might say originalism is a surrender and that we're just giving up. I mean, the liberal mm -hmm. judges will do whatever they want. Whenever they have a majority, they will impose their will on America as the Warren Court and to a large extent the Burger Court did on all kinds of issues. And so when we sort of talk about what you were just saying about, you know, we're, you know, we're going to cut back Marbury and all these sort of very high-minded principled things, aren't we just giving up power that we have today and allowing the other side to kind of run, run wild? We have a Supreme Court majority. Why don't we use it? Well, use it to do what? Is, is, is the idea use it to just impose anything you want that's Dude, ideologically do, compatible with your views? That would be views? the criticism. That's not my view, but that would be the, yes, I mean, essentially that would be the argument. Yeah, I don't think that's a very good argument for a lot of reasons. I mean, if, if you think the left has misused the judicial power, the remedy is to overrule those decisions. The remedy is not to just make lawless decisions of your own in order to balance the books, right? I mean, judicial officers are bound by an oath to uphold the Constitution. So I don't see how that would be compatible with a person who believes in textualism saying, I'm going to disregard my interpretive commitments just to get back at the other side for perceived abuses that they engaged in 50 years ago. That it just not only does that seem petty, it just sounds totally lawless. I agree. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I, I, this is pe people are saying. Yeah. Uh, I, I, all right. So let's talk about kind of the future of originalism. Yeah. So I, I, I think we're at an interesting time for the kind of the conservative legal movement and originalism. And at least from to my mind, it's sort of impossible to overstate the degree to which Roe versus Wade shaped the conservative legal movement and many of the things that we talk mm -hmm. about today grew out of kind of the reaction to that extraordinary overreach mm -hmm. of judicial power. You know, so from Robert Bork and before him Richard Dixon talking about strict constructionism to the much more well theorized originalism we have today, you know, now that Roe is gone, mm -hmm. you know, what do you think what's next? I mean what what's next for the for the movement and for mm -hmm. these ideas? Yeah, Roe against Wade was a symbol of the living constitution mindset. It was right. a symbol of judicial arrogance and overreach and Largely, you know, if you are a textualist and if you are an originalist, it's it's just it, it's, it epitomizes everything that's wrong with the living constitution philosophy. So, I don't think the legacy of Dobbs is going to be one that reduces abortion or access to it. In fact, there's empirical data showing abortions have actually gone up since the Dobbs decision. But what the legacy will be is Dobbs was a, at least the way the opinion was written, a real repudiation to the mindset that judges can just go off and invent so-called substantive due process rights just because they think it's good policy and then impose their ideological beliefs on the nation. Now, your question is what's next now that Roe's been overruled? There are plenty of other decisions, even though they're not as prominent as Roe, that reflect that same type of philosophy to judging, right? And we saw a lot of this in, it's not just the Warren Court and the Burger Court, a lot of this came from the Rehnquist Court and the Roberts Court. What do you do about that? What do you do about a case like Obergefell, which is also a non-textual right that was imposed through the doctrine of substantive due process? It's not a right that's deeply rooted in tradition, so it doesn't satisfy Dobbs's test for a proper substantive due process right. Will that be overruled when there's more public support for same-sex marriage now than there is for abortion? You know, that, that's an interesting question. I, if you're asking me to predict what the courts will do, or you're asking me what should, when you no, say I what's mean, next, like yeah. what should, what's next in terms of what I want to target? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot on my on my list. I mean, I think one of the things in my crosshairs is a lot of the decisions that were made in the area of criminal law and criminal procedure, which haven't gotten much attention. There's been so much focus right now on abortion and homosexual rights and transgender rights that some of these criminal law issues have flown under the radar screen. But some of those, I think, are ripe for reconsideration or overruling. The exclusionary rule, even Justice Kagan has shown some skepticism about that. And there's, I think there are five votes right now in the Supreme Court to overrule that if we get the proper case to them. I mean, what we have to do is just flood the courts with lawsuits so some of these cases start trickling up to the Supreme Court. That's really the challenge. And we know the big law firms aren't going to bring any of these cases. So no, it's up to solo practitioners and boutique firms to do all this and find the clients, bring the cases, find the vehicles. The exclusionary rule is an interesting one. I mean, do you think that's had sort of a negative effect on the scope of Fourth Amendment protections too? Because yeah. the remedy is so awful in you know, a murder case or something like that to suppress the evidence and let the criminal go free, that it actually has caused these rights to be con tightened? Yeah, quite possibly. That's true. I mean, there's a lot about the Fourth Amendment right now that's completely, just the yeah, just, it's non-textual. If you actually, people need to read the Fourth Amendment and see what's in there, right? <laughs> there, there is no requirement of a search warrant even though the Supreme Court says there is, and there are a hundred... It's quite the opposite. Yeah, it just says, yeah, yeah. 
it just says searches have to be reasonable. No unreasonable yeah. searches and seizures. And there's a limitation on warrants. A warrant cannot right. issue without probable cause. And we still have the Supreme Court saying there's a warrant requirement, although subject to, I haven't counted the number of exceptions they've created to this so-called rule. But they have a warrant requirement when they want it. They, they don't have a warrant requirement. They invoke an exception when they don't want to have it. There's a lot that needs to be cleaned up in that area. And that's less of an ideologically charged issue, so there may be less pushback from, I think the left is spending a lot of their energy now on other issues besides this. So th this, I think, is a very promising area for, for more movement. And I think we could probably get five, six, maybe even seven votes to, to cut back on, on the exclusionary rule and some of these other court-invented doctrines. Another decision I'd love your thoughts on is, is Mallory against Norfolk Southern Railroad. Mm -hmm. So for those who don't know about Mallory, um, you know, Mallory, Mr. Mallory was a former employee of Norfolk Southern. He lived in Virginia. He he'd worked previously for the railroad in Pennsylvania. The railroad does a lot of business in Pennsylvania. The railroad also had consented to jurisdiction in Pennsylvania under a state law that said if you want to do business here, you have to consent. Um, despite all that, the railroad argued that the 14th Amendment's due process clause, because mm -hmm. we all know we fought the Civil War to protect companies from being sued in Pennsylvania, right. uh, prohibited the them from being subjected to jurisdiction. And so the coalition is really, really interesting, and maybe mm -hmm. augurs a lot more to come. The majority opinion is by Justice Gorsuch, with Thomas, Jackson, and Sotomayor. Justice Alito, Alito concurs, and the dissent is uh, Justice Barrett, the Chief Justice, Justice Kavanaugh, and Justice Kagan. What's going on here? What do you make of all this? Yeah. Uh, very interesting lineup, as you say. Yeah. I agree with the majority. Uh, my friend Ashley Keller argued the case for the plaintiff. And if you read his brief, it was a very strongly originalist brief. So you would expect to see the court's originalists in the majority. And you did see some of them. I think the justices you mentioned, yeah. Gorsuch, Thomas, and Alito. And Justice Jackson. Famed, no, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jackson and Sotomayor joined the majority, probably for other reasons. Yeah. But it was an interesting lineup, and you saw really the divide, I think, between some of the more purists, the more of the formalists on the court, and some of the more pragmatics uh, in the conservative wing of the, of, of the Supreme Court, where, where Roberts and Kavanaugh are, are going the other way. So the due process clause, you mentioned, this is really a variation of substantive due process, right? There, people are trying to invoke the due process clause to put substantive limits on state authority. Sounds a lot like Roe against Wade and Obergefell and other cases where this has been invoked. So I've always been skeptical of the idea that the Due Process Clause can constrain the states in their exercise of personal jurisdiction. Certainly if you're making arguments that the constraints go beyond what was originally understood in 1868 and tag jurisdiction, general jurisdiction, if you consent to jurisdiction, all those things. Burnham, the case from 1990. My name's yes. not me, not yeah. me. <laughs> uh, not a relative. Yeah. So. If, if, if you're going to reject the view and think the courts can impose that through, I suppose, a common law method, I don't think you're doing originalism or textualism. So, Speaking of Burnham, so in Ma Mallory was a little odd because mm -hmm. you had this consent requirement. I mean, in a, if you haven't thought about it, just you can just demure. But do you think there's a good argument that tag jurisdiction should just apply to companies the same way it does to you know human beings like us? Where I, if they yeah. Have, they have an employee in the state and you... We tag the employee. I haven't given a whole lot of thought to how that interacts with the practices of, of 1868. But what, what makes Mallory, at least for me, a relatively easy case was the practice was well established at the time the 14th Amendment That's was enacted. Sense. right? So the people who want to declare that unconstitutional have a really steep hill to climb in showing how a practice that clearly existed at the time the 14th Amendment was ratified, and there's nothing in the text to show this is somehow improper, how does that become unconstitutional? Right. I mean, do you think I, there are other doctrines like, so it see, from, from where I sit, it seems like there are a lot of sort of what I'll call pro-business doctrines mm -hmm. that were kind of developed in the last hundred years. Yep. A lot of momentum in the 90s with the kind of Kennedy, O'Connor, Souter Court um, that don't really have any basis in the original meaning of the Constitution, caps on punitive damage right. and stuff like that. Do you see this as like maybe a next wave of litigation opportunities to sort of make the law more originalist and more, you know, in line with the right way of thinking about well, the Constitution. Well, it's hard to say because it's not clear where the votes on the Supreme Court come out on this. You know, you pointed out not all the conservatives are on board with cutting, you know, trying to scale back these doctrines. Uh, I, I think what I would like to see is Congress codify these doctrines. If, if these really are good for business, that's really Congress's job. They have the commerce power. Business interests have plenty of clout in Congress. Why not just get a statute? Now, business isn't spending resources to codify these things because they have for the last 50 or 60 years depended on the courts to do this for them. But with a decision like Mallory, with that pork decision from last term, possibly cutting back on the Dormant Commerce Clause, 
maybe this will induce members of Congress and business interests to try to get codified legislation. To me, it's really the role of Congress to protect business from overreaching states, whether it's California with its pork rules or Pennsylvania with its personal jurisdiction rules. Congress can enact legislation to protect corporate interests in those situations. The courts shouldn't be doing it for them if Congress isn't stepping up to the plate. Yeah, it does seem that most of these constitutional provisions were not adopted in a <laughs> sort of flurry to protect big business from the legislature. Right. We have a fairly populist background as a country, not a corporatist one. That's true. Uh, okay, so one more question, and then maybe we should take a break, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your most controversial view? If you have one, oh, and I don't, and I don't mean though, but I don't mean like to the New York Times and Harvard that's going to get you picketed or something. Right. I mean with our friends, like the kind of thing where at the Federalist Society people are going to be hissing and saying, "Oh, Jonathan, come on." I don't know if they'll be hissing at some of this stuff. But they're, they're <laughs> we don't hiss at the Federalist. Society. There are a lot of people who were not happy about the Texas Heartbeat Act, even among conservative circles. You know, they thought it was something that would threaten other constitutional rights and erode the judiciary's authority in protecting constitutional rights. I don't think those concerns were valid, but, and it, partly because the Texas Heartbeat Act framework will only work in certain situations. It's not going to work if the Supreme Court clearly supports the right, mm -hmm. and if the right is clearly defined, because in those situations there's no reason to fear a private civil enforcement lawsuit. You know the courts ultimately have your back, right? So you can go ahead and do your thing. If somebody sues you for it, it'll just be thrown out in five minutes. So I, I don't think those the, the idea that the Texas Heartbeat Act would threaten all constitutional rights, I thought that was hyperbolic. And I think we've seen in the two years, two and a half years since it's taken effect, that you really haven't seen anyone attempt to emulate this tactic in other areas with the exception of Gavin Newsom in California. So I think to answer your question, that's probably the most controversial idea or thought that I've had that would be, when you're talking about Federalist Society audiences, it, it, that would probably be the one. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Thank you.